um, there was a file of meditations from Holland about the tenets, and there was one about how Svatantrika explained the way things exist conventionally. So I thought it's a kind of complicated topic, but his meditation seemed quite helpful. So I have adapted it a little bit according to our our context here. Um, but mm. I thought that might be helpful. So imagine you're in the forest, walking through our beautiful forest, and you happen to notice one tree that's particularly beautiful or interesting. Imagine you stop and just gaze at this tree. So how do you know that it's a tree? What characteristics does it have that enable you to identify it as a tree? So those characteristics appear clearly to your mind, and in that way, you know that it's a tree. You establish the existence of the tree through your awareness. If there was no awareness of the tree, there would be no tree. Like if there was no sentient being, no being with a mind that was aware of the characteristics like a trunk, branches, leaves, or needles, and so on. So if there's no sentient being to perceive those characteristics, be aware of those characteristics, there would not be a tree. So understand that what is needed to establish the existence of a tree is a combination of two things. First, those characteristics, like trunk, branches, and so on. And secondly, a correct awareness to which those characteristics appear and which then posits or establishes the tree. Both of those two things are needed. If there was only one of those two things without the other, it wouldn't be enough to establish the existence of a tree. And now imagine continuing your walk and coming back down to the abbey, and you notice a car parked in front of the abbey. So how do you know it's a car? What characteristics are there that enable you to identify it as a car? So those characteristics appear clearly to your mind. And in that way, you know that it's a car. You establish the existence of the car. So again, there are two things needed to establish the existence of the car. One, it's unique characteristics. And two, a correct awareness to which those characteristics appear and which then posits, establishes the car. So if objects did not have their own unique characteristics, how would you know what to call them? How would you know how to use them? If things didn't have their, their unique characteristics, you could call the tree car and you could climb inside of it and drive it to town. Mm -hmm. 
Likewise, you could call a car tree and then chop it down to make firewood. And therefore, for something to exist conventionally, there must be unique characteristics from the side of the object, plus a correct or non-defective awareness to which they appear and which establishes the existence of the object based on those characteristics. So this is how the Svatantrika school explains the conventional existence of things, how things exist. And uh, yeah, before we get into the slides, um, I came across in Alex, on Alex Berzin's website uh, a kind of amusing example of this, um, this same kind of idea. Also, it shows how we could use it in a, in a practical way. So let's say when you look in the mirror in the morning, you notice a red bump on your face. Although the red bump has on its own side the defining characteristic mark that by convention could be the divine, defining characteristic mark of a pimple or something ugly or a disaster. So this is you know, it does have the, the, those defining characteristic marks. But this characteristic mark doesn't establish the red bump as existing as any of those phenomena independently of someone mentally labeling them with those categories and designating with those words. So the object does have some characteristics from its own side, but it still requires a mind to label it as ugly pimple or <laughs> disaster. <clears throat> so since these characteristics mar characteristic marks don't have this power by themselves, so the, the, the defining characteristics from their own side don't have the power to force the mind to give that kind of label, and then it's our choice how we label it. If we simply don't label the red bump with the categories ugly pimple and disaster, we won't have a problem with it. We can simply label it a red bump. <laughs> Other people may label it as an ugly pimple and a disaster because in fact it does have those characteristic marks to be labeled in that way. But we would realize that if they label it in that way, that's because they have a problem with red bumps on their own faces. And so they think in terms of those categories. We don't have to think in such terms. It is not truly established as an ugly pimple that is a disaster simply from its own side alone. And just because other people label it as a disaster and label it as such, that too by itself doesn't have the power to label it as a disaster. So if we care what others think, then without getting upset or stressed, we simply apply some cream on the red bump. Think of the problems we have when we don't realize this. <laughs> Can you relate to that example? <laughs> I'm sure we've all been there. <laughs> ah, disaster. <laughs> Everybody will look at me and that's all they will see is that big ugly pimple on my face. So yeah, it's good to help helpful to realize we do have a choice how we label things. So anyway, I thought those examples might be helpful to understand better the Svatantrikas, how they explain things. There's something there is something. They say there has to be something in an object, certain characteristics in an object. Yeah, but but that alone isn't enough. It, it still requires a mind um, perceiving those characteristics and then establishing the object or labeling the object in that way. So two things, two things are needed. And so um, some members of 
FOSA, uh, what does that stand for? Friends, Friends of Shravasti Abbey, Abbey, Singapore, mm -hmm. FOSA, Singapore, uh, who apparently are studying the Nalanda course that's taught by Geshe Dorji Dandro. Um, they sent a couple of questions about Svatantrika. We did this through um, Venerable Damsha, and she forwarded them to me, and I sent a reply, but I thought it might be helpful to um, talk about this in class. Some some of you may find it helpful. And so they were wondering about this expression, merely labeled or merely imputed, which is used by the prasangikas. We've heard it all before many, many times. Things are merely labeled. Um, but they weren't sure if this term is used by svatantrika as well. And they were also wondering about the difference between how Svatantrika and Prasangika explain the conventional existence of things. Um, and so I think there may be different opinions by different masters or texts about whether the Svatantrikas use the term merely or not. But according to uh, Kensu Jamba Tekchok, who's one of my teachers, also one of the venerable teachers and the author of this wonderful book. Um, he says that in this book, um, Svatantrikas do say that things are merely labeled. They do use that expression. However, when they use the term mere or merely labeled, they have a different, it has a different meaning than for uh, prasangikas. So the mirror, mirror is kind of a eliminating word, a negating word, a word that kind of leaves, you know, pushes things out. <laughs> uh, so what mirror negates for the svatantrikas is true existence, because you know they believe that things are empty of true existence. That's their version of emptiness, emptiness of true existence. But mirror doesn't eliminate or doesn't negate inherent existence because they do say that things have inherent existence. So that's what they mean when they say things are merely labeled. It means things are not truly existent. But then when Prasangika, the second bullet point, Prasangika, when they say things are merely labeled, then for them, mere negates inherent existence and also true existence because for them inherent existence and true existence are the same thing. Um, so they both, according to Jam uh, Kensu Jamba Tekchok, um, both schools do use the term mere or merely, like merely labeled, merely imputed, um, but mm -hmm. it has a somewhat different meaning for each of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. However, third bullet point, the book Searching for the Self, which is volume 7, page 70, there it says um, that both Prasangika and Svatantrika say all existence are posited by terms and concepts. Prasangika say they are merely designated, but Svatantrika do not add the word so I think, yeah, this is from His Holiness. His Holiness, uh, I think his teachers are mainly from Drepung Rosalie. Um, I think Geshe Dorje Damdo also from <laughs> Geshe uh, Drepung Rosalie. And Geshe Damdo here. Um, so maybe in Drepung Rosalie, this is what they say. That, oh no, no, Svatantrika don't use the term merely labeled. Kensu Jam Tekchuk, on the other hand, is from Sarah J. <laughs> and so he says, um, yeah, they do say it. So, again, it's another one of those things where there's different opinions, mm -hmm. different assertions. And actually, in here, uh, this uh, Kensu Jam Tekchuk, page 101, um, he says, up until now, you may have heard that only prasangikas assert 
that things are mere name, mere designation, mere imputation. That is correct. If you understand that it means that the Svatantrikas do not accept that things are mere name in the same way that, Svata, that the Prasangikas do. Now, so when it says only Prasangikas use the term mere, mere name, so what that means is, oh, the Svatantrikas have a different view. They, they don't understand things in the same way as Prasangikas. When it is said that only the Prasangikas say everything is mere name, it means they are the only ones who understand mere as negating inherent existence and existence from its own side. So those who say that only Prasangikas use the term merely label, that's, that's the meaning. They are the only ones who refute inherent existence. Um, however, if you don't define mere in that way, then it can be said that both systems assert that things are mere name or mere imputation. In this case, mere has a more general meaning, with Svatantrikas explaining that it eliminates true existence, while the Prasangikas say it eliminates inherent existence. So it all depends on how you want to define the term mere. And you do need to be careful about this because the word mere or merely does appear in other contexts, and even the other schools use it in certain uh, situations. For example, Vaibhashikas, um, they say that when it comes to the person, what is the person, what is the illustration of the person, they say it's the mere collection of the five aggregates. So they use the word mere, but in that, for them, Mere isn't refuting inherent existence because <laughs> they really believe in inherent existence. So it means something else for them. Um, also, even Sotrantika, Sotrantika, the second school, they say that uh, permanent phenomena are mere imputations by conception. Mere imputations by conception. So that sounds very much like Prasangika is saying, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have that meaning because Swatrantika do assert inherent existence. So what they mean by, you know, a permanent phenomena is a mere imputation by conception means it's not impermanent. It's not an impermanent, solid, you know, they say that impermanent phenomena are ultimate truths, right? So, you know, very much existing from their own side. On the other hand, permanent phenomena like space, cessation, emptiness, these are more abstract phenomena. They don't have such strong existence like impermanent. They are just imputed by conception. So anyway, I'm just pointing out that the word mere, the term mere, can have different meanings. It doesn't always mean like what Prasangika means, that things are empty of inherent existence. So if you come across that term, you need to, you know, think about or ask questions. If you can't figure it out yourself, ask your teacher, what does the word mere mean in this context? And I was thinking in our ordinary language, we, we use the word mere. Um, like, for example, a mere drop. A mere drop means only one drop, no more than that gates, refutes anything more than a drop. What is this expression? A mere lad. <laughs> what does that mean? Not very big. Not very, big. Big. Not very old. <laughs> Just a kid. Yeah, maybe it's more used in old English or old Scottish, but us Americans contemporary, we may not use it as much. We're still on Svatantrika. Um, so the next main uh, topic is the mode of presenting object possessors. And so uh, this is looking at like what is a person? A person is one type of object possessor, but mainly object possessors are talking about minds, consciousnesses, awarenesses. 
so the first bullet point um, says, the Svatantrikas assert six consciousnesses. So that's clarifying that none of the Svatantrikas are like the Chidamatras and say that there's eight consciousnesses, including the Alaya Vijnana, the mind basis of all. So there's just the usual six consciousnesses, the five sense consciousnesses and the mental consciousness. And the person, when it comes to pointing out what is a person, um, all of the Svatantrikas say it's the mental consciousness. They point to the mental consciousness as being the person. Is there a difference between saying uh, the Svatantrikas assert the mental consciousness is the illustration of the person, and the Svatantrikas assert the mental consciousness is the person? Yeah, there is a difference. I don't fully understand this term, illustration. Mm -hmm. uh, I've come across complicated explanations of it that I don't understand. But when um, the Kensar Jamba Tekchuk, in his, his commentary on tenets, he said what it means when it says illustration of the person is um, when you search for the person among the five aggregates, you find something. So my my I could be wrong about this, but my understanding is you have to say you have to point to something as being the person because you know according to Buddhism we say that a person goes from life to life and in one lifetime they create actions, they create karma. Then in another lifetime or many lifetimes later they experience the results of those actions. So you have to find a way of explaining that, even though all Buddhists say there's no permanent uh, permanent unitary independent self, that kind of self doesn't exist. There's also no self-sufficient substantially existent self, that kind of self doesn't exist either. And this goal would say there's no truly existent self, so that kind of self doesn't exist. But there still has to be some kind of self, some kind of person to be able to account for karma and rebirth. And so that's how I understand it. How, you know, that each school would have their own way of pointing out what is the conventionally existent self, the self that creates actions, experiences the results, practices the path, and eventually attains whatever goal they're working for, nirvana or enlightenment. That's how I think of it, but I can't be 100% sure because some of these terms, like this term for illustration, um, does have a specific meaning, but when it gets, gets into that kind of, that aspects of Buddhist philosophy, I just get kind of... And then, of course, prasangika um, are quite unique in that they don't point to anything within the aggregates, any part of the aggregates as being the person, they say it's the mere eye. Mm -hmm. Mere eye, meaning merely labeled eye. The eye that's merely labeled um, in relation to the aggregates. Because they say if you point to anything in the aggregates as being a person, then that's inherent existence. They're saying there's an inherently existing person, and that's something they refute. Okay, that help. <laughs> then, next point. So, so Trantikas for Tantrikas do not assert self cognizers. So, that's that type of mind that has as its object another mind. Uh, for example, when we see something, we're looking at this external object. There's another mind simultaneously looking at that mind that is seen. Only, yeah, only seeing that mind. So the Sotrantikas don't accept that, which is interesting because they are like the Sotrantikas in some ways, but the, not in this way because the Sotrantikas do assert self cognizance but the Sotrantikas for Tantrikas do not. They do not. So 
not like the Satantrikas and all this. But then the Yogacara Satantrikas do assert self cognizing. As they say, there are four types, all four types of direct perceivers, including self cognizers. So, what are the four types of direct perceivers? Sense direct perceivers, mental, mental direct perceivers, yogic direct perceivers, self cognizer direct perceivers. Yes, so there are four. And then it says self cognizing and yogic direct perceivers are necessarily non mistaken. I think that was the same as Chitta Mantra. Um, so a self-cognizing direct perceiver has as its object another consciousness. It doesn't perceive, you know, tables and chairs and other things, but it only perceives uh, consciousness within one's own mind. And um, it never sees that consciousness mistakenly doesn't see it as externally existent. So it's always non-mistaken. Yogic direct perceivers are always non-mistaken because their objects are something like impermanence, subtle impermanence, or selflessness, or emptiness. And um, they're always correct in the way they perceive their objects. It's always Yogic direct perceivers are in the minds of Aryas. So only Aryas have yogic direct perceivers. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so they're always non mistaken. But then the other two types of direct perceivers sense direct perceivers, mental direct perceivers they can be either mistaken or non mistaken. So, what would be, what would be an example of a mistaken sense direct perceiver? Saying a rope is a snake, or saying a snake is a rope. Yes, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess if you saw a, a rope is a snake, a but, but more small? specifically, we're talking about the yoga charas for tantrikas. So, what oh, do they? What do they say happens when we see things? When we have direct sense perceptions external objects. external objects right so to our sense perceptions seeing hearing smelling tasting touching objects those objects appear externally existing like they're already there before we see them before we perceive them uh, rather than they're coming from a seed in the mind arising from some seed or imprint in the mind that mistake things appearing externally existing but it says sense sense direct perceivers can also be non-mistaken so what would be an example of a non-mistaken sense direct perceiver for this school um that's not a, no we can't experience emptiness with a sense Perceiver. That's a yogic direct perceiver. Mental. It has to be mental, not sense. <clears throat> I had trouble thinking of one, but um, <laughs> I found in a commentary from Nalanda by one of the Geshe's there, he gave a Buddha's sense direct perceiver. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> so a Buddha's mind is free of all mistakes. Uh, so when a Buddha sees an object, it wouldn't appear externally existing. Um, but I think we could also say a solitary realizer arhat. Um, because according to this school, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but this school says that solitary realizers meditate on the, oh it actually comes later, they meditate on the emptiness of duality, the emptiness of subject and object being of different substances or th different natures. So solitary realizers meditate on that and realize that. 
And so an arhat, a solitary realizer, arhat has completely eliminated that kind of, um, I guess you could call it ignorance, that kind of wrong conception in their mind. So they no longer would see things as externally existing. Even their sense direct perceivers would not perceive things as externally existing. I think we could give those as examples as well. Mental direct perceivers, they can also be mistaken or non-mistaken. What would be an example of a mistaken one? <coughs> This is a mental direct perceiver. A thought is not a direct perceiver. A thought is a conception. Mental direct perceivers are different. Like there's, they say there's always a very, very short mental direct perceiver that follows a sense direct perceiver, and it perceives the same object. Like when we see the table, first we have an eye consciousness perceiving the table, Following that, there's a very short moment of a mental direct perceiver perceiving the table. And then after that, thought starts. We start thinking about it. So it's very short, very brief. And um, we don't, ordinary beings aren't able to notice it. It's, it's too short. But that kind of mental direct perceiver for us would be mistaken because the table would still appear externally existing. That mental direct perceiver would still see the table as existing out there, not something that came from the mind, came from a, a seed ripening in the mind. <clears throat> and then for a non-mistaken mental direct perceiver, um, we could use the Buddha, <laughs> the mind of a Buddha, but also they give the example of a clairvoyance. If somebody has clairvoyance, they're able to see another being's minds. So the object of that would be a mind. And it seems that whenever a mind is seeing a mind, the conscious, you know, consciousness seeing the consciousness, the consciousness will never appears externally existing. It doesn't appear like something uh, that didn't arrive. I, I don't know. I, I, th I think that's what I read. It's, it seems to be only, it seems to be only sensory objects like forms, material objects, physical objects that mistakenly appear externally existing, but minds do not. I think I read that. So, so a mind perceiving another mind would never make that mistake, thinking it's externally existing, because externally existing has a different meaning. You know, I mean, you would know it's somebody else's mind and not my mind, but you wouldn't have the mistake of thinking that mind um, didn't arise from... I'm not sure how that works, actually. <laughs> you, you would know. If I'm looking at Venerable Semke's mind, I would think I know it's her mind and not my mind, but it wouldn't appear externally existing. That's what I read, but now when I think about it, I'm wondering, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I think they mainly say it's just forms. It's just physical physical things, material things that appear in that way, but not minds. What is the mind of those who see the mind? I don't know if you think that way, if you would understand it that way. I don't know. Like I say, I read that, and I just sort of read it and said, okay, yeah. And then I didn't really think about it, but now that I'm talking about it, I don't know. What does that mean? I'll have to go back and look, see if I can find more explanation about that. But they do say that. They say that clairvoyance, which is a, a mental direct perception, kind of mental direct perception, it doesn't have that mistake not mistaken in that way. So I was thinking about this school, the Yogacharas for Tantrikas, and just how they would explain 
our sense perceptions. So for example, if we have a sense perception seeing yellow, like there's the yellow book over there. So when we have a, an eye consciousness seeing yellow, um, if we, as long as we do see it as yellow and not as green or blue or red or black, then that's correct. That aspect of the experience is correct. It's not a wrong consciousness. But the yellow would appear externally existing, according to this score. It appears like it's not something that arose from a seed in my mind, but it's out there, already out there, when I just come along and see it. So the yellow appears like that, and that's mistaken, according to them. That part of the appearance is wrong, is mistaken. It doesn't exist that way. And they would also say, because there's the tantricas, they would say that yellow appears uh, inherently existing, existing from its own side, having its own characteristics. And that's correct, according to them. They say, yes, it does exist that way. It does exist in there. It has to, have, has to exist from its own side, with its own characteristics. So that part of the experience would be correct as well. Now, does yellow, does the yellow appear truly existing? When we see yellow, does it appear truly existing? No. Not this school. Prasangika, yes. But this school says no. Um, the appearance of true existence, even though true existence is a, an object of negation, the main object to be negated, they say it doesn't appear to sense, to our sense uh, consciousnesses. It only appears to mental consciousness. And I don't fully understand why that is. Maybe we'll get into that later, <laughs> but that's what they say. So the main mistake for, for, for this school, this Yoga Chasta Tantra, is, is the object appearing externally existing. So all of our sense direct perceivers have that mistake. Does that make sense? Kind of complicated. All these different schools and all the different <laughs> what they point out is mistakes in our. Well, it sounds like they're, they're contradicting. Yogacara is contradicting the Svatantrika part of the school. It's like I can't quite see where they can agree. Why? Well, this whole idea about things, Yogacara is saying that it's every, the, everything out there appears as a latency from the same latency as the mind. No, it doesn't appear that way. Like when we see yellow, um, according to them, the yellow that we see just came from a seed in our mind. Right. Like right. the cheetah mantras. Just, right. yeah. Right. That's the reality. But how it appears when, when we see yellow, it doesn't appear that way. It appears like it's not externally existing, not see it in the mind, but external, out there. So that's wrong. That's a mistake that happens when we, when we perceive things. But don't the Svatantrikas then say that things do inherently exist? That they yeah, do exist but this is something side? else. Inherent existence and external existence are not the, same, the same thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we have to kind of figure out the different meaning. So yeah, so they would, that's what I was trying, that's what I was thinking about and trying to work out in my mind. They would say that when we see yellow, it appears externally existing, meaning it appears like it didn't just come from some seed in our mind. And that's wrong. In reality, the truth is, the yellow that we see just came from a seed in the mind. The seed ripened and produced this appearance of yellow. But the Svatantrika part of that school doesn't agree with it coming from a seed. 
Y no, this school, Yoga Chara Sotonika, say things do come from seeds in the mind, and, and yet they, they still, still exist, exist inherently. inherently. They still have their own characteristics. Okay. It has okay. its That's own characteristics from its own, own side, side, even though no, it just it came, came from, from a seed, seed in the, the mind, mind, but it still <laughs> exists in there. So going back to the meditation, it's the idea that the car and the tree, they both came from seeds, from an imprint in the mind. Yeah. But that imprint has yielded the appearance of an object that does have the specific characteristics. Specific characteristics. Yeah. Characteristics. Yeah. 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 A tree and a car have very different characteristics. <laughs> even though they come from latency in the mind. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a little bit more complicated than shooting <laughs> <clears throat> but Shida Mantra is pretty complicated too. Okay. Ready to go on? Now, so in the text by Jetson Chirky Gelson, um, there was this list of common assertions of three schools. The last three schools we've been looking at Sotrantika. And Shida Matra and Svatantrika, Madhyamika. These are all things that they assert. And he just listed these things, but there was no explanation of them. But my guess is that um, Prasangika, the next school we're going to get to, has different assertions from these. And so these are being pointed out now. And then later, when we get to Prasangika, um, we'll realize, oh, these schools say this, but Prasangika says otherwise. Mm -hmm. So we won't fully make sense of these until we get to Prasangika, but I thought it might still be good to go through them just kind of quickly and talk maybe a little bit about them, but then it will be, when we do get to Prasangika, then it'll become more clear why these are put up here. Um, so the first one is direct perceivers are necessarily non-conceptual. So this is what we've been this is what we've learned up until now. This term that's translated as direct perceiver refers to a type of mind that is non-conceptual, like sense direct perceivers, mental direct perceivers, and yogic direct perceivers, and so on, these different kinds of direct perceivers. They're not conceptual because they perceive their object directly, naked, nakedly, they use the term nakedly, rather than through a conceptual image, which is the case with conceptual minds. So direct perceivers are always non-conceptual, right? We've heard that before. Yep. Well, when we get to Prasangika, we'll find out otherwise. <laughs> And partly the problem is this term. I mean, the term that's translated as direct perceiver is munsum. And that term actually doesn't say anything about mind. There's nothing in that term that indicates it's talking about a mind. And in fact, that same term is used for, you probably heard one way of dividing objects, phenomena, is into the manifest, mm -hmm. the hidden, and the very hidden, I don't know if Venable uses those terms or something else. Obscure. Manifest is obvious, you know, things we can see very obviously. And then there's hidden phenomena, for example, emptiness. Emptiness is a hidden phenomena. Mm -hmm. And then there's very hidden phenomena. And um, so the term for manifest phenomena is the same term, the same term as direct perceiver. Direct perceiver. So that's the tricky thing. Yeah, when Prasangika explains that term, they'll explain it differently. But we'll, we'll get to that later. And Vaibhashika is omitted here with regard to this one because remember what Vaibhashika say about direct perceivers? They have this rather odd idea. They say that uh, the sense power, which is like a, f a very subtle physical thing inside the eye, it's a it's form, it's physical, but it's very subtle. That that also perceives objects. Remember that? 
they're the only school that say that, and all the other schools kind of poo-poo them. And <laughs> well, there's my boss, she gets... Yeah, so, um, but they have their reasons for saying that. But, yeah, so for them, yeah, direct perceivers are not necessarily non-conceptual because they can even be a sense power. They don't even have to be a mind of consciousness. The second one is a subsequent co uh, cognizer is necessarily not valid. This is what we've learned up until now because... Remember why? What's the criteria of a valid cognizer or a reliable cognizer, as Rumble calls it? It's the first moment. It has to be the first moment, the initial, new, fresh, first moment of experience is valid. And subsequent cognizers are like the second and the third and so on. They're kind of old. They're not fresh or new anymore. And so they are not included in so again, when we get to Prasangika, we'll find that they say otherwise, subsequent cognizers can be valid. Third one is, if a consciousness is mistaken to its determined object, it's necessarily a wrong consciousness. So the term determined object mm -hmm. is another, it's a synonym of conceived object. It's it's an it's only with conceptions only conceptual minds have a determined object and um, and it's equivalent to the engaged object or the main object that you're dealing with so when you're thinking about your mother for example you're thinking about remembering about your mother and that's a conceptual mind and your mother would be the determined object the main object that you're thinking about. But then what actually appears to your mind is just an image, uh, mm -hmm. not your actual mother, especially for those of us whose mother is no longer alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just an image, a conceptual image of our mother. But the determined object of that mind, the engaged object, is mother, our mother. So if a consciousness is mistaken to that object, then it's a wrong consciousness. Um, so an example of being mistaken to a de to the engaged object would be the classic example of sound being impermanent. So if you're thinking sound is impermanent, which some Indian schools believe, the sound of the Vedas, these holy scriptures that go way back in time, that sound is permanent. The sound of the Vedas is permanent. I don't fully understand what they believe, but anyway, <laughs> I believe. So they believe sound is impermanent, is permanent, sorry, sound is permanent. So the engaged object there is sound, and the mind is in, engaging with it incorrectly, thinking it's permanent when in fact it's impermanent. So that's an example of a, a wrong consciousness. Or if you're thinking about your mother and she appears like a Martian, <laughs> green with horns sticking out of her head, or, you know, something weird like that. <laughs> so obviously not the way your mother really looks. So that would be a wrong consciousness. But yeah, later we'll probably find out that Prasangika says otherwise. And the next one is, if it's a mistaken consciousness, with respect to a phenomenon, it's necessarily a non-valid mind. With respect to that phenomenon. Um, so an example that Kenser Jamatejo gave was the conception apprehending sound to be permanent. So this, this is definitely not a valid mind. This is a non-valid mind with respect to sound. So I don't know what Prasangika will have to say about that. We'll find out later. Um, then the last one is, if it's an inferential cognizer, it's necessarily a non-valid mind with respect to its appearing object. So do you remember why that is? What's the reason? If it's an inferential cognizer, isn't it more direct perception? 
inferential cognizer is not a direct perception. It's conceptual mind. It's mm -hmm. always conception. Mm -hmm. And concept what's the appearing object of a conceptual mind? Mm -hmm. The generic the image. Appearance. Yeah, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. image, the generic image or conceptual mm -hmm. image or whatever. And all conceptual minds are mistaken, mistaken. to that because that that image, the conceptual image, appears like the actual object, and the mind isn't able to know that it's not the actual object. It's kind of fooled into thinking it is the actual object. So even inferential cognizers, like inferential cognizer of emptiness, <laughs> that's still uh, mistaken with regard to the appearing object, because there's just this image of emptiness appearing, but it looks like the real thing. It's like really emptiness. And so the mind can't tell that it is just an image, not the real thing. So non-valid minds, in other words, just say um, mistaken. Well, I'm not sure why they said non-valid. But maybe non-valid with respect to the appearing object. It can still be a valid mind. In fact, I think inferential cognizers are always valid minds. But it can be valid to emptiness, for example. <laughs> it's valid with regard to emptiness, but not valid with regard to the appearing object, the um, image of emptiness. So I think that's what it means. It's a valid mind in general, but with regard to that particular object, the appearing object, it's not valid. Because it's mistaken. I think that's what it's mean. But, but like I say, we'll come back to these later when we get to Prasangika, because I think in Prasangika we'll come across their assertions about these and they might not be more clear. So let's just leave this for now. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Okay, the next point is selflessness. How the Svatantric, what the Svatantrikas say about selflessness. And so, again, with each of the schools that we've gone through, this is one of their, one of the points that we look at. What does that school say about selflessness? And in general, selflessness is divided into two types. There's selflessness of persons, and then selflessness of phenomena, which usually means anything other than a person, any kind of phenomenon that's not a person. Um, and But with the first two schools, by Bashika and Sutrantika, they didn't talk about selflessness of phenomena. They only mm -hmm. talked about selflessness of persons. But then when we got into the Mahayana schools, Chittamatra, and now this one, Madhyamaka, they talk about selflessness of phenomena as well as selflessness of persons. So first we look at the selflessness of persons. There's two types. So this is just the same as before uh, with the other schools. There's a coarse type of selflessness of persons, the person's emptiness of being permanent, unitary, and independent. So that's as the other schools explain. That's like the, the kind of person or self that the non-Buddhists believe in and assert. And all the Buddhists say, no, there's no such thing. And then the subtle selflessness of persons, again, this is as before, the person's emptiness of being self-supporting, substantial existence. So that's the kind of mm -hmm. the feeling of a self that's like the boss, the mm -hmm. controller, the one in charge. So again, all the Buddhists unanimously reject that kind of self, that kind of self doesn't exist. So that's, yeah, this is nothing new here, this is as before. Now, the next uh, is the selflessness of phenomena. And here there are differences between the two uh, divisions of Svatantrika, the Yogacara and the Svatantrika some differences there. So it starts with the Yogacara Svatantrika. So they say there's two types of selflessness of phenomena. The first is coarse, coarse, and this is as like the Chitta Matra. 
Um, although the, the terminology is sometimes complicated, but I think you, you know, we know, we've heard this before, we know what it means. So a form, for example, a table, and the valid cognizer apprehending it, so the table and then the mind, um, the sense direct perceiver apprehending the table, they're empty of being different substances or different entities. So that's just another way of saying that both the table and the mind perceiving the table arise from the same cause, the seed in the mind. That seed ripens and produces the, the appearance of the table and the mind perceiving it. Both arise at the same time. And so they are one nature or one entity, one substance. So that's the reality. But that's not what appears to us. So it seems like the table is out there, externally existing, not coming from a seed in our mind. And so that, so it seems like a different nature, different substance, different entity from the mind. But that's uh, false. That's wrong. That's mistaken. So we need to realize the emptiness of that wrong mode of existence. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's the same as with Chitta Mantra. So that's, of course, selflessness of phenomena. And then, um, I was, yeah, I was wondering too, because with Chitta Mantra, Chitta Mantra also had this other way of explaining emptiness, do you remember? Um, that, uh, where does it go? Things not being the basis of names by the by way of their own characteristics. Remember we discussed that. Hmm? Yeah, there's different ways of saying it. Um, but there's this kind of they say Chidamatra says there's this wrong conception that uh, we think almost like a name exists inherently in the object. rather than just, you know, put on the object by, by human beings. So I remember we talked about that, like, uh, if we think about when we're kids and we're taught the names of things, and then we learn this is a ball, this is a hat, this is a cup, this is a table. We have this sense that that name exists in the object, the object from its own side or by way of its own characteristics is the basis for that name. Something like that. I, I don't fully understand. But anyway, this is one of the things that Chitta Mantra talks about and that we have to meditate on, we have to realize that kind of emptiness. So I was wondering if Yogacara talks about that as well. And I hadn't come across any mention of it. And then when I was reading this commentary by the Geshe at Nalanda, Geshe Gelson, who's teaching tenets, he said that the Yoga Charasvatantrika do not assert that one. They don't assert that kind of emptiness. He said that for Yoga Charasvatantrika, the referent basis of a form does exist by way of its own characteristics, as do all phenomena. Therefore, they don't accept that second type of emptiness. Do you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> it it doesn't doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just something I was thinking about. But in Chitta Matra, and we did talk about this before, they have they do have those two levels of emptiness. Um, when they talk about emptiness, one is the emptiness of external objects, and the other one is this thing about names, um, objects being the basis of names. So just to know that that second one, that second type of mm -hmm. emptiness, doesn't apply oh, here with the yoga chara. They don't. They don't talk about that. They don't agree with that. This is just something I was curious about, and I found an answer for it, and I wanted to share it with you. So <laughs> <It's> exciting! <laughs> Always more things to learn. But again, there could be different opinions about that. Maybe there's some masters who say, "Yo." Oh, <laughs> okay, then the subtle selflessness of phenomena. 
is all phenomena as emptiness of true existence. Um, so this is as we've been talking about. The meaning of true existence would be if um, an object existed only by way of its own characteristics without this second part of the mind uh, perceiving it and, and, and positing it, establishing it. So they do say things do exist by the way of their own characteristic. There's something coming from the side of the object, but there has to be something coming from the mind. It has to be a mind that posits, that perceives, and then establishes that, like the meditation we just did. If there's no mind that's perceiving the trees up in the forest, then there wouldn't be any trees. <laughs> it wouldn't exist. But Buddhism says there's always a mind. You know, our minds aren't there, but there are other minds there. So that's okay. Emptiness of true existence. So Yogacara has two types of selflessness of phenomena. But down at the bottom it says the sotran, sotrantikas, vatantrikas only assert the second one, not the first one, because they say there are, there is external existence. Things do exist externally. So then we talk about emptiness of true existence. <laughs> so the next part, um, yeah, it's kind of contrasting. Um, the different kinds of selflessness. So we have, in general, two kinds of selflessness. Selflessness of persons and selflessness of phenomena. And um, if we just talk about, forget about the coarse forms for now, but just the subtle ones, the subtle selflessness of persons and the subtle selflessness of phenomena. So how are they different? What's the difference between them? And this is actually something important from the point of view of, Svetan of Prasangika. <laughs> Probably won't make, you know, make much sense until we get to Prasangika, but from their point of view, there's, there's a big difference here. So for this school, for the Svetantrika, the, way, the difference between the subtle selflessness of persons and subtle selflessness of phenomena is by way of the object of negation, what is being negated, yeah, the false mode of existence that is being rejected and thrown out. So that's the difference between them, not by the bases of emptiness. So the meaning of bases, bases of emptiness means the object that you're using to look at and analyze and try to understand, you know, does it exist that way or not? Is it truly existing or not? So you're always doing that with some object. The object could be a table or a car or a tree. It could be a body. It could be a mind. It could be a person. Okay, so the basis of emptiness means the object that you're focusing on and trying to understand. How does it exist? So to make that more clear, the example given is a person. So um, in fact, we're advised when we begin our understanding of emptiness that we use the person, specifically our own self, our own I. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, we should start with our own I and analyze that to see how it exists. And so using a person, yourself or some other person, so refuting true existence on that base, person, that is the subtle selflessness of phenomena. So when you're um, taking a person as the basis, an object, and you're analyzing it, and asking yourself, is it truly existing or not? Does it exist truly or not? And if you refute true existence, you realize, ah, true existence is impossible. It doesn't exist. It's false. On that basis, person, person. That's the subtle selflessness of phenomena. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that means that like in some cases, maybe in the Prasangika, when they say uh, phenomena, selflessness of phenomena, it actually only means phenomena other than persons. 
But here, for Satatika, selflessness of phenomena, because it's the emptiness of true existence, it applies to all phenomena, including persons. Everything. Because a person is a phenomena. A person is a phenomenon. Phenomena is just something that exists. So with regard to the same basis, the person, and if you refute true existence, realize emptiness of true existence, then that becomes the subtle selflessness of phenomena. But then the second, um, second point is if you refute uh, self-supporting substantial existence on the base person, that's the subtle selflessness of person. So again, if you're focusing on a person and questioning, does this person exist in that way, as a self-supporting, substantially existent person? If you're analyzing that and you realize, no, that kind of person doesn't exist. This person is empty of that kind of existence. So that's the subtle selflessness of persons. So I think maybe we'll come back to this next week <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> of the class when you're a little more fresh. <laughs> um, it, it, the Tibetans consider this a really important point because it, the way the Svatantrikas explain selflessness and the way the Prasangikas explain selflessness is different in this regard. And they make a big deal out of it. I don't fully get the significance, but they, they consider it to be quite significant. Um, they talk about it again and again. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll do this again next week. Maybe it'll make a bit more sense. <coughs> do the aggregates have any play in the selflessness of phenomena like they do in the high of Prasangika, or is it when they well, say person they would be They would be phenomena, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for them, for this school, when they talk about um, the subtle selflessness of phenomena, mm -hmm. the word phenomena is is Empty. synonymous with existent and object. Right. So everything, whatever exists, is a phenomena, phenomenon, and so that would include persons and aggregates and tables and chairs and even emptiness itself. Mm -hmm. Whatever exists, mm -hmm. whether it's impermanent phenomena or permanent phenomena, all phenomena, all things that exist, they are all objects that we have to realize as empty of true existence. Mm -hmm. True exist Emptiness of true existence applies to all phenomena. Mm -hmm. So when we're trying to understand emptiness of true existence, we have to do it. Well, it doesn't mean we have to take every single phenomena one by one. <laughs> they say when you... Well, at least they say this in Prasangika. When you realize the emptiness of one object, then it's very easy to realize the emptiness of all other objects. So you could insert in here refuting true existence on the base. Um, dog is a subtle selflessness of phenomena, or person specifically for this subtle selflessness? Well, a dog phenomena. is a person. That's true. Table. Table. <laughs> 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 yeah, but then if you put table in there, uh, for the first one, it doesn't work. For it wouldn't the work for the one. second one because the second one is the self um, person. only applies to persons. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll no, it's just like <laughs> prosecute your brain is going yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. You know, we're mainly exposed to the prosangika view, and you know, we think, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then we come across something else like this, and oh. <laughs> But yeah, this okay. is one of the big differences between those two schools. So it is good okay. to know about. Good, but you. yeah, we'll return to it next week. Mm -hmm.